Zem Than Leon, would you be willing to lead us in prayer? And then once you've led us in prayer, then uh, Dr. Yehli will continue with you. Me? Yes, sir, if you don't mind. Okay, well, let's pray. Father God, once again, we want to say thank you for the life that you have given us to enjoy the most and the best that we can according to your word. Thank you for this special class to remember things which are very essential to understand about the importance of life. Father God, as we study your word, please open our minds and thoughts and heart, especially our understanding. We need you so much. So Father, and this class will be a great blessings to each one of us as the professors and as the students, as we discuss, explore into your holy word that you bless us so that Father and the from this study and that we might be able to bless and so that we bring all the glory back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Dr. Yegley. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, greetings to each one of you. I hope your Monday has gotten off to a good start and that you are uh, as our brother prayed that you are enjoying your life and your ministry and your work. And uh, that's what we're <clears throat> going to be keying in here on for our uh, next uh, part of our syllabus. So let's go ahead and take a look at the syllabus. Uh, notice <clears throat> that uh, for uh, today, you should have read the article from Bible.org on the theology of Ecclesiastes. That probably didn't take you very long to read, but uh, it was a <clears throat> helpful, kind of concise view that uh, I think would, would be helpful. Now, uh, the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at what I expect on the sermon that's coming due on July 1st. Notice it's a sermon on chapter 5, verses 10 through 20. And uh, this is a good-sized preaching text, not too big, not too small. And I want you to basically exposit this passage. Now, why it, it bears a fair amount of discussion here, exactly what I'm looking for. And so... Uh, that's what we're going to take up. Is we're going to take up a significant portion of our time today. Uh, so uh, next time, notice on the 27th of June, you have reading from Embrace Life Under the Sun. And then I found a, a little short theology of work uh, uh, resource here. Uh, there's actually a whole organization called the theologyofwork.org. And uh, this organization is uh, built around uh, helping believers see the importance of their work. And uh, being good, being good uh, servants of Christ in whatever field we're in, uh, but whatever we do for, for a living, that's a very important calling from the Lord. It's interesting, in this Theology of Work presentation I have listed for you there, uh, there are, <laughs> they don't mention anything about Ecclesiastes until they get to the 10th thing the Bible says about work, and that is that it's the gift of God to us. If you ask me, I would have begun with that, up front. That would have been my number one thing I would have talked about. But they wait until the very last biblical principle about work to even mention Ecclesiastes. Ah, that's typical these days. You know, so many people don't think that 
you can get normative theology out of Ecclesiastes, and so this is kind of what I expect. But I think it will be <clears throat> interesting to you to uh, take a look at uh, one of these, you know, views. These are, these are Bible-believing people, and they're serious about their work, and so you can get sort of an overall quick view of the biblical theology of work in the scripture by reading this uh, particular uh, passage, this particular resource. Uh, now, another resource uh, for you on the uh, project is to listen to other sermons that have been preached on work. Now, you might say, how in the world can I do that? And the answer is, you can uh, go to a website that has thousands and thousands of recorded sermons. Some of them <clears throat> are quite good. Others are not exactly exp expositional, but you might be able to get some, some help. Now, this particular website, get a, get a pencil handy, because uh, I'm going to some of you are probably no doubt already familiar with it. Others of you perhaps have never even heard of it, but it's called sermonaudio.com. Okay, so sermon audio is all one word, and then uh, dot com. Very simple web address. Uh, and you can go on there and you can do a search for. Uh, preachers. You can do a search for uh, particular passages of Scripture. It's, it's highly accessible, and it's free. Anybody who wants to listen to sermons on whatever particular topic can go on sermonaudio.com. Now, just by raise of hands, how many of you have, have already been on this website? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Luke's been there, and Ger uh, Gerard's been there. Good. Uh, that's a very helpful uh, site for you. Luke, you got something you want to say? Oh, I thought you did. <laughs> you you had your, uh, your your mic unmuted, so I thought you were gonna you were gonna pitch in on. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and um, yours truly has a message on there about work, and uh, you might choose to listen to it or you might not. I obviously don't want you to listen to it and just copy everything I said, but uh, back a fair amount of time ago, I got to preach on our, in summer school church. We used to have a... Uh, summer church program at Bob Jones University and uh, faculty members and staff and whatever students were there for summer school would uh, come to church service on Sunday morning and I got a chance to preach at, during that time. I think that's what it was. I don't know, maybe it was a regular chapel session, I don't remember now, uh, but um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, if you find that, it's a blessing to you. All right, so without further delay, let's go ahead and we'll get into our uh, our topic today, which is how to go from exegesis to exposition. All right, now, basically what we're gonna do at this point, can everybody see that? Everybody tuned into this? Okay, good, from exegesis to exposition. Now, what is expository preaching? That's, this course is called uh, Exposition of Ecclesiastes. What makes a, a sermon expositional? Now, we used to view expositional preaching as simply uh, taking a particular sized preaching text 
and just starting with the first verse of that text, and then the second verse, the third verse, and just go through the text chronologically, that was expository preaching. And then um, <clears throat> you also had uh, topical preaching, or where you would take a particular topic and arrange it as, as you would, and tell what the Bible said about a particular topic. Maybe something like giving, or evangelism, or the second return of Christ. Those were topics. And you could go anywhere you wished in the scripture to amass or assemble, I should say, passages that dealt with that particular topic. <clears throat> the third kind of preaching that we used to uh, <clears throat> view uh, would be textual preaching, where you would pick a particular small text, maybe even one verse, and uh, <clears throat> read the verse, and then once again you're free to uh, go wherever you wished to find supporting material for that textual idea, or you could stay right uh, in that text and, and uh, explain the meaning of the text in its context. Now, we no longer view expositional preaching, or at least I don't any longer view, nor do many people, most people don't view expositional preaching as just simply taking a text and going verse by verse through the text. Now we look at expositional preaching as <clears throat> showing, number one, what the Holy Spirit's intention is uh, in the context for that portion of scripture you're preaching from, <clears throat> and to show uh, what the Holy Spirit's intention of that passage was for our lives. In other words, what is the correct interpretation of the, of the passage? <clears throat> and when we get that, uh, that, that uh, Holy Spirit intended meaning, then we exposit we, we show not what we want the text to say, but what the Holy Spirit intended the text to say, and how that applies to our modern hearers. Okay? And that last part, showing how it applies to the modern audience, is a key aspect of exposition. And we'll talk about that as we go through this lecture. So you can basically have an expositional message on a group of verses as, for instance, Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 20. And you can show, you don't necessarily have to go verse by verse, you can hit <clears throat> some group of verses or one verse, and, and then uh, you, could, you don't have to stay chronologically through the passage. But basically, <clears throat> it would be expounding a particular small uh, portion of the scripture. Or you can have expositional preaching on a topic. Or you could have expositional preaching on one single verse. It, the, the size of the preaching text is not the issue. As a matter of fact, I've even done expositional messages that set up a series in an entire biblical book. And so um, this, is, this is what we want to center in on. We want to center in on uh, showing people in our congregation or whatever group of people is listening to us preach this, we want to show what uh, the Holy Spirit's intention is for the meaning and application of this preaching passage to our hearers. All right, so <clears throat> basically what I would say is that this is the crucial step some preachers omit. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm kind of having trouble with my voice this morning. All right, so why is this step crucial? Going from exegesis to exposition. Well, perhaps you've Listen to a message preached by someone who did an excellent job making you sense that you were there in the setting of the biblical text. Perhaps the person's a good storyteller, 
and uh, tells the story of the of the text, or they they may be a fascinating exegete, and they're telling you exactly what that passage meant to the original hearers. Now, this is not something you should avoid. It's just you can't, as a preacher, you can't stop at the setting of the biblical text. <clears throat> now, what is exegesis? It is basically the foundation for all expository preaching. And uh, exegesis is concerned with several things. Uh, number one, it's concerned with uh, context that is crucial. Any expositional message must cause your audience to realize what the context of the original setting of the of your preaching text is. Uh, basically, quick, if you quick. set the correct context, uh, you can you can make the scripture say virtually anything you want it to. Quick question, Dr. Eglin. Yeah, I'm question. Sorry to, to interrupt, I think maybe your PowerPoint might be frozen again. Um, oh man, this happens so quite. Have, oh, yeah, we have a little routine here. I'm not sure how we're doing it, but whatever you did the last couple of times should work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see now. What did I do the last couple of times? I think you started to screen share again, if I recall. Okay, now can you see that, Joel? Well, we see okay. it. We just see the title slide. Okay, now, how about this? Why this step is crucial? No, sir. No, we're just on the front title slide. Maybe, what if we try, yeah, if we try canceling the screen share and then just sharing again. Um, okay, let's see. Let's try, let's go back here. Um, okay, there's, there's my, uh, <coughs> my screen with me. Okay, now let's go back to a new share, and we'll try this again. Uh -huh. All right. Okay, now let's see. Let's go, let's go actually into presentation mode here. And see what happens now. Well, now it's not going into presentation mode. Hmm. That's interesting. of going from exegesis to exposition so crucial. Well, perhaps you've listened to a message, as I say, preached by someone who did an excellent job, making you sense that you were there in the setting of the biblical text. And that's, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that you're doing a good job of exposition. So as I say, number one important thing is to set the proper context. Uh, and I was about to tell you a funny story about uh, what the importance of context is. You know, that's what the cults do. Cults take verses out of their context, and then they can make these verses say practically anything. I, <clears throat> you can imagine, for instance, someone who preaches a message on uh, the biblical doctrine of rapid suicide. You say, what are you talking about? There's no biblical doctrine of rapid suicide, but if you were to take certain verses out of, our, out of context, you could make the Bible teach that. You might say, well, <clears throat> how could a thing like that happen? Imagine a scenario where uh, somebody wins a person to the Lord, and as they're discipling them, the person asks uh, the person who won him to the Lord, how should I study my Bible? And the person says, well, here's what I've done for years. Uh, when I get up in the morning and it's time for my devotions, I take my Bible and I just close my eyes and I flip through the, 
Bible and put my finger down on a page and I read uh, what, that, what that verse says. And that's my verse for the day. So I recommend that method to you. The person tries it <clears throat> first day, he opens his Bible, he flips through with his eyes closed, puts his finger down, and reads what the, the Bible passage is for the day. And today, the passage is, and Judas hanged himself. Okay, well, the fellow says, um, that doesn't sound like a very good uh, text to, to think about today. I think I'll try it again. And so um, he closes his eyes once again, flips through the, through the passage, and uh, <clears throat> he, he puts his finger down, opens his eyes, and read, reads this verse. What thou doest, do quickly. Excuse me. Go thou and do likewise. That's the second one. Go thou and do likewise. <clears throat> now, this new believer is realizing at this point that he doesn't like the way things are turning out here. And Judas hanged himself. Uh, go thou and do likewise. Uh, the person's just not seeing any blessing here in this particular Bible study methodology. So he says, I'll try it one more time. And he, he closes his eyes, slips through the Bible, puts his finger down, opens his eyes and reads, what thou doest, do quickly. And he's just developed the scriptural doctrine of rapid suicide. It's ridiculous. It, it, the Bible doesn't teach that. And yet, <clears throat> if you take verses out of their context, as I say, you can make the Bible teach nearly anything you want to. And so we want to avoid any semblance of that. That's why the first step of exegesis is always context. What is going on in the context of our particular passage? Remember also that biblical uh, uh, passages have several layers of context. They have the context of the sentences around it. We would say this, the context of the pericope in which our preaching text appears. Pericope is just a fancy word for uh, the paragraph, the biblical paragraph that that biblical, our preaching text is in. And then it has a wider um, context of a biblical section. In other words, what's going on in the section of the book where our paragraph resides. And then sections go together to form the context of a biblical book. We ought never to preach a text where we haven't set uh, its context within the overall biblical theological message of the book. All right, so when you're, <clears throat> when you're preaching on work in Ecclesiastes, you need to let your audience know not just what's around the, the uh, text, chapter 5, verses 10 through 20, but you have to show them how this verse relates to the overall biblical theology of the book of Ecclesiastes. And then Ecclesiastes is set in the, gen in the wider context of the Old Testament. What's, how does the book of Ecclesiastes advance the biblical theology of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is set within the context of the entirety of Scripture. So you can see that there are multiple layers of context. And the more layers you can help your audience understand, the better your audience will be able to appreciate how this biblical text fits into the entirety of what God is doing in the scripture. And when we can help our audience see the various multiple layers of context, we have just helped the person integrate this particular biblical text into the, the entirety 
of Scripture. If we can do that, wow, we've really uh, done a crucial thing for our hearers. That way, when, when we approach a text and <clears throat> when, when we help our people understand how this text fits into the wider context of Scripture, then we help him uh, analyze the Scriptures and know what uh, the, the purpose of this particular text is to the totality of, of the revelation of the glory of Christ in Scripture, the glory of God. And uh, if we do that, then we'll avoid certain problems that can creep in. For instance, <clears throat> one of the problems that we have, can have with preaching a text like a, a text on work is simply moralizing the text, making Ecclesiastes teach certain biblical principles about how to be a good employee. Well, frankly, uh, we ought to be good, at good employees, that's certainly true, but there's a wider theological purpose for this text. And if we just simply restrict it to how to be a good employee, we've missed uh, a significant the theological context here. And so the, the, the passage has a biblical theological context. It has, uh, frankly, a systematic theology context as well. Because in systematic theology, we can ask the question, well, uh, what, how does this passage enhance our, our knowledge of what God expects of us? How, how does this passage reflect a way that we can glorify God wherever we are? <clears throat> you see, that transcends simply a moralizing perspective on the, on the passage uh, remarkably. And uh, so basically, uh, you know, this, it just uh, should never happen that um, we, we don't do a good job of setting the context. Second aspect of exegesis is what I call uh, lexical syntactical analysis. That's a mouthful. So let's talk about those two elements of, of lexical study and syntactical study. Uh, <clears throat> basically, an analysis of lexical elements means, uh, do we know what the words mean in a particular uh, passage we're studying? Uh, you, because the, it's so crucial that we understand word meaning. You might say, well, <clears throat> if I have a translation, in the language I, I know best, uh, isn't that enough? Well, that would be enough if we had inspired translators of Scripture, but unfortunately we don't. And so uh, the, the translator might have made a good, a good uh, translation of that particular word in that particular context, or he might not. <clears throat> now, why is it that, uh, oh, for instance, take the English versions. Uh, perhaps a particular translator did a good job, and perhaps the translator didn't do a particular good job. Or maybe if the issue is that there's no particular word in English that means exactly what a particular Hebrew word meant. You might say, well, how am I going to understand uh, context? I mean, uh, the word meaning if I don't know Hebrew? Well, that's a very good question. Let's go uh, back to uh, the, uh, the screen here. And um, all right, can you see me? Screen, screen up there. Um, yes. Let me, show, let me show you some sources you can use. 
uh, starting with the simplest one and working up towards the more complicated. All right, simplest one you can use would be this. This is called the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. It's two volumes. <clears throat> it's done by conservatives. It's edited by R. Laird Harris, Gleason L. Archer, and Bruce Waltke, or Waltke, or Waltke, or however you want to pronounce his name. Good German name, but you know how German names go, they get slaughtered. Uh, just like mine, when people call me Jigegel, Jigeli, or Jigeli, uh, I am forever uh, correcting people on the, inter on the pronunciation of my name. But uh, anyway, this is an excellent source. The, the entries are concise, and not only that, but they're tied to Strong's Concordance numbering. And so if you don't know how to look it up in, in the uh, Theological Word Book of the Old Testament, look it up in Strong's Concordance, get the number, the Strong's number for the word you want to study, and then all you have to do is take that number and uh, look it up in the index of the theological word book to get the theological word book's number for the word. Yes, I know, it gets a little complicated. And, uh, or, and then you can look it up right, right to look directly in the theological word book. Uh, another very important source here, to show you this one, I'm going to my bookcase here. And this is called the New International Dictionary of uh, Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. Boy, that's a real mouthful. The New International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis. Now, you'll notice this is edited by Willem Van Gemeren. Okay, Willem, is, it's not William, it's Willem, W-I-L-L-E-M, and then Van Gemeren, G-E-M-E-R-E-N. -E 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 now, this particular source uh, is six vol five volumes, and once again, it is done by conservatives. And you can uh, look up, this is going to be a little bit more difficult for you to find your particular discussion of a particular word, but if you look in the index, it will help. And in, in the back of volume five is an index that shows you the various topical uh, things they, they study. So, for instance, you might uh, look at work and then uh, the uh, there would be some key word studies done uh, in, in the vocabulary of work. Uh, then the most technical of our word study books is something called the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. So here it is, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. Now, this happens to be volume eight, but there are 16 volumes total. I don't have the 16th volume because it's all Aramaic words, but um, I don't know this, even on Logos, I think you're gonna, this is gonna set you back about $1,500 to buy the entire set. This is, uh, if you have a, a library near you, that uh, has a good theology section, and you could go to the library and use this. But uh, this is edited by, by three men, Johannes Bonnevek and uh, Helmer Ringgren and Hans Josef Fabry. Now, as you can probably tell by the fact that you don't recognize probably any of those men's names, these are not conservatives. These, the men who do the articles in the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament are 
are liberals. Uh, but overall, I would say they do a fairly good objective job when it comes to uh, doing word study because uh, they're looking simply at the data of the Old Testament. These men are excellent linguists and therefore they can, they can give you good direction on what these words mean. Okay, so that's lexical analysis. You can do also do your own word study if you can uh, find a source where you uh, have all of the places in the uh, Old Testament where this word occurs. Then you can look at each of the particular contexts and you can say, well, what does this word mean in that particular context? Uh, also, you can um, Yeah, you can, you can use something like George Wigram, the, uh, uh, what's that called? The Concordance, uh, ever the, uh, oh boy, let's see, here it is right here. I haven't used this for a long time because I've got all my word study searches on Logos, but uh, this is called the Englishman's Greek, or I, oh, I've got the wrong one. You need the, the, the Englishman's Hebrew concordance of the Old Testament. As I say, once again, this is by George Wigram, W-I-G-R-A-M. And uh, what Wigram will do is it's tied, once again, to Strong's concordance numbering. And if you look at the Strong's number, he'll show you every place in the Old Testament that that particular word uh, appears. And uh, then you're looking to go through <clears throat> and look at the way the Old Testament uh, writers used a particular word. Because when it comes to lexical analysis, the uh, main idea we want to keep in mind is that word usage determines word meaning. How did the biblical authors use a particular word. Is it a specific word or is it a general word? And uh, what are the various nuances, that is subtle shades of meaning difference between, uh, if it's a general word, between the various ways it can be used in a particular context? We have, we, have, we have words in every language that are quite general. Uh, one of the ones I, use, <clears throat> I like to use as an illustration in English is the verb to run. Uh, the verb to run <clears throat> can mean a dozen or more different things depending on what the subject is or what the direct, uh, you know, uh, direct object is. You have to look at the context. For instance, if I, if I say to you, I, I, I got up early this morning to run. All right. Now, you, you know right away that means something like to jog or to uh, cover ground more quickly than walking. Usually runners are quicker than walkers. This refers to locomotion by moving your legs. But what if I said, I got up this morning and my car wouldn't run? Well, now cars don't have legs. You don't expect the, the car to jog. Now you understand that the verb to run means to operate correctly. Or I might say something like, uh, there's a new political candidate who's decided to run for office. Now you realize that the verb to run means to campaign for a particular political office. Or you could say, I planted a vine in order to run up my trellis. Okay, so now you understand that the verb to run means to grow slowly in a particular direction. And depending on the context, 
The English verb to run can mean a dozen or more different things. Then again, you can have very specific words. Uh, I, can re I can remember one time I had in class a Japanese student, and he was telling me that Japanese has a specific verb to put a piece of clothing on you depending on what the piece of clothing is. So if I say I put my shirt on, then it's a different verb than if I put my shoes on. It, that sounds uh, very complicated, but uh, once again, languages can get very specific. Now, <clears throat> in a translation of the scriptures, if you have a very specific word that uh, they translator translated more generally, or the other way around, a uh, general word that he translated too specifically, and he got the wrong specific usage, you can run into problems. And so that's why <clears throat> we want to have precision of interpretation that allows us to know, okay, how did the biblical author intend a particular word to what, what did he intend it to convey in any particular context? So that's what you're looking at with lexical analysis. Um, and then along with word meaning goes grammar, grammatical structure. Yeah, Luke, question. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering uh, if you have any input on the handbook series. The handbook series, I mean, the Biblical Translator's Handbook? Yes. <clears throat> mm, well, <clears throat> those are often very helpful. If you can find one on the biblical book you're studying, they are very handy. Um, typically, uh, they're not done by conservatives, but, um, you know, still nonetheless, they're very helpful. And especially if you're doing any translation work, they're essential. So do you, I, I don't, I've never seen the one on Ecclesiastes, if they even have one on Ecclesiastes. They have it on Logos. Oh, okay. Who, who's the author of it? It's Ogden, Graham, Zogbo, and Linnell. Okay. Yeah. All right. So those guys are not conservatives, but they're typically going to know Hebrew uh, lexical issues and Hebrew syntax very well. So they can be of great, great uh, help to you. Now, um, can I um, pop in with a different question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, give me a second. Okay. Um, so, you mentioned the theological dictionary of the Old Testament, and uh, on the New Testament side, the criticism that James Barr made about some of the lexical practices that they were following on the on the New Testament side is. I've never used the Old Testament side of it. Is it, it, is it similar to TDNT with some uh, of the lexical excesses or criticisms? Yeah, you know, bars, you're talking about uh, his book on semantics. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, um, you know, every, you have to be careful whenever you're using any of these word study books because everybody is susceptible to venturing into inappropriate um, studies when it comes to word meaning. Uh, for instance, uh, Barr mentions root fallacy. And uh, you know, because, because a particular noun appears to be related to a particular verb and therefore has to be limited to the uh, idea of the verb, uh, that, that can get you into trouble. Uh, or uh, root fallacy, the, the particular word. In the New Testament, this is, this is apropos because so many New Testament words are compound words. So you have, uh, you have uh, the Greek forming a, a, a particular intensive idea by adding in a preposition on the front of the verb. Uh, and so bar cautions, way, you know, be careful. Uh, you know, just, just because they, and a word is made up of two words uh, 
doesn't mean it's the sum total of the two words it's comprised of. I like to illustrate that by asking the question, what does the English word cowboy mean? Well, if you go by root fallacy, it's simply a, the, the sum total of cow and boy. Well, how does that work? Is, the front, is it like a, a, uh, a creature made up of, of uh, you know, a boy's face, but a cow's body? I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, it's not the sum total of the two parts. That's not gonna be as much of a problem in the Old Testament. So, you know, I, I don't really see TDOT being just full of, of uh, things that would violate uh, Barr's excellent uh, cautions. Uh, but hey, anybody can fall into lexical pitfalls. It's very difficult field to study. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir, that's helpful. I, another, okay. and this is more the shape of a comment, but when you were talking earlier about, you said, um, as you work through a, a translation, maybe the translation missed that at that point. And <laughs> broadly speaking across most books of the Bible, you know, I feel like our modern translations do a really good job, but it is interesting in this connection specifically with Ecclesiastes. Yes, I mean, so much is subject to these kind of issues, what you do with Hevel or what you do with a handful of expressions. and. If you mess those expressions up, you can sh you can change the whole shape of the book, and and people do. So anyway, I, f I found that very apropos for what we're discussing here. Oh, yeah, you, you aren't just kidding. The Ecclesiastes and interpretation, especially of lexical syntactical issues, I mean the pitfalls are everywhere, and you have to keep your wits about you. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I don't know that there's any way to uh, you know, get over that, except just go ahead and do, and do the study. And then you might, fall your, you might find yourself going in a wrong direction or falling into a pit. Well, climb out of the pit and resolve you're not gonna do that again. <laughs> I, I mean, here's the deal with Ecclesiastes. The human author, is the wisest person who ever lived. And so when we have, when we begin a study of it, we have to realize this is the wisest person who ever lived. Do we think we're going to have an easy time of interpreting what he said? And uh, the answer to that is a resounding no. This is gonna require everything we've got and then some. And it's still, at the end of our study, we have to have the humility to realize, and I might have botched up my interpretation here in a number of areas. Uh, we have to be very careful. All right. So we've talked about um, contextual analysis, lexical theological, a uh, lexical uh, syntactical analysis. And syntax is simply, as I say, the, um, the way that words are uh, related to each other grammatically in a sentence. And when my supposition here is that when we understand word meaning and the syntactical relationship between words in a sentence, then meaning ought to be quite transparent. Uh, now, the, 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 the pitfall is if we've misunderstood the word meaning or we've misunderstood how the author is intending a particular grammatical structure within that verse, then we can still miss the interpretation. So we have to, uh, at this point, and consult commentaries. Uh, and you can get various viewpoints among the various commentaries. And so, as, as Joel just said, if a person has uh, just tacitly assumed, because the NIV translates Hevel as meaningless, that that's what the word means in every context in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, well, you're going to have even a commentary that will go astray because Hevel does not mean meaningless. I don't think it means it. And 
any particular context. It, it's that's a terrible translation of Hevel, but um, yet there are there there are people who who uh, basically come to that conclusion. You know, it's really it's really pretty amusing because here, for instance, is Ian Provan's uh, commentary on the Book of Ecclesiastes. And notice it comes from the NIV application commentary series. So the English version that um, underlies Provan's commentary is the NIV. The NIV is the version that translates Hevel as meaningless. And yet Provan says in his commentary that Meaningless is a terrible translation for Hevel. <laughs> and I can just see now the, uh, the editorial committee of translators, that the translators that did the NIV saying, oh, woe is, woe is us here. Uh, the, we get a guy to write a commentary and he doesn't even like the way we translate it. <laughs> I've, the most important uh, word in the book of Ecclesiastes we better go back to the drawing board, guys, the next time it's time to revise our translation. Uh, but that's just what happens. Uh, all right, so there's contextual, uh, contextual analysis. There's uh, lexical syntactical analysis, which is hugely important. All right. And if you don't know uh, Hebrew, then your commentaries are your, your, your go-to source for determining word meaning and grammar in Hebrew. As I say, sometimes these commentaries get it right, sometimes they don't get it right, but that's up to you to evaluate. And you're gonna have to sift through all the particular viewpoints and, and trust the Lord to help you uh, know which commentaries are steering you the right way and which ones are taking you out in left field and leaving you there. Uh, okay, then the next aspect of, of uh, uh, the exegetical process that is very important is, is asking the question, all right, how does our overall biblical theology inform our understanding of what's going on in the biblical book? and as well, our systematic theology. Okay, so I'll just call that part of the analysis theological analysis. Uh, the reason why this is important is because, uh, well, for instance, when we talk about what Solomon has to say about death, there are a lot of even conservative uh, <coughs> commentaries that will say something like this. Ecclesiastes doesn't have a single thing to say about life after death. <laughs> I know, Joel's looking at me funny, but this is, this is just a sad thing because what's happened is liberal commentators have decided that Solomon knows nothing about what happens after he dies. All he knows about is going to his, his long home, as the, as the uh, translators, the King James translated it. It's literally his home for no long. It's his, uh, it's his permanent home, or even if you want to translate no long as eternal, his eternal home. Uh, I just think it's the idea of permanence for, a, for you know, this age. It is. It's his, permanent home. You go to the grave, you expect to be there a while. But that does not mean that Solomon doesn't know anything about uh, life after death. Uh, that's, that's just a crazy uh, thing. And so if, if you read somebody who's, who's going down that way, you say, wait a minute, that violates biblical theology. It violates um, systematic theology horrendously. And so that can't be what Solomon is, is teaching. There must be something that these people have missed. 
And uh, of course, there are many things they've missed, and we'll talk about that when we get to the view of Ecclesiastes on the topic of death. So extremely important that we bring in our knowledge of biblical theology and systematic theology in the exegetical process. All right, so that's kind of an overall view of exegesis. That's foundational to exposition. There's no such thing as expository preaching that doesn't rest on the solid foundation of exegesis. All right. So, any questions? That's I've covered a lot of a lot of ground here in a short amount of time, but I think that for many of you, this is not something new to you. you you've been used to this. Any questions or that's comments? Helpful about what you said about the eternal home, because um, I guess, yeah, that's helpful. That was helpful to kind of push me back a little bit there. Um, what about the statement right after that, the spirit, you know, when the, the person dies and the spirit returns to God who gave it? Is that, is that legitimate to take as Solomon pointing to an afterlife? Well, a lot of, a lot of people would say no. It's, that's not pointing to an afterlife. We would say yes. That's indicative. Of, of an afterlife, what's that we live on after our body goes to the grave. Definitely. Another thing, uh, you know, there's this common concept in Ecclesiastes that there is a day of reckoning coming, that there's, that we are to be examined concerning our life's work. Well, when's that going to happen? Um, and uh, yes, yes, Phil, I said something about, <laughs> about syntax. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I spent quite a bit of time on that. Uh, must have just tuned in a little late. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, the, the uh, you know, that's obviously got to take place after the person's lived his life. It's not fair to judge somebody uh, until he's actually finished his life, that means the judgment is coming sometime after death. And that, that has to mean that we live on after death. And that's one, of the, that's one of Solomon's key principles in the book. We're accountable to God. We're going to stand before him someday to give account for the way we've lived our life. And uh, that mandates we still, that we are still alive, that our spirits live on. And so <clears throat> well, there are a number of things there we'll talk about that, in fact, sh show that Solomon knew of an afterlife, <clears throat> uh, but that, that you could say that was not his primary focus. He's, his primary focus is what happens under the sun. And uh, so that's, he's somewhat restricted uh, his discussion to what he can see, Yet, there are many times when he tells us things that he could not possibly have known simply by observation of what's going on under the sun. And uh, he, he's basically talking about theological truth in two areas. Number one, what's been revealed in the scripture before him, in other words, informing theology from the already written word of God. And then he knew things by direct revelation as well. Well, we'll talk about that some as we, and when we get to certain passages that mandate that he had direct revelation from God as well. Okay, so now that we've talked about uh, exegesis, let's get back and uh, talk about <clears throat> Uh, once again, exposition. All right. Let's try the Zoom slideshow. Let's, let's get back to this and see. Well, doesn't appear to be allowing me to share one point at a time. So we'll just keep on doing this the way we have been doing it. So basically then, <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is 
that we have to go beyond exegesis. Um, so that you, you could have a person, he's a great exegete, and he, and he gives you the feeling as you leave the service after listening to him preach, uh, boy, he, he really made me feel like I was there in the, in the original setting. But then, as you're driving home in your car, you think to yourself, well, what did that text have to do with uh, me? Yeah, well, what's up here, Joel? So I think we have the blank problem again. It's just... What? Yeah, I think we have that blank problem again. I think we're stuck again. Maybe I oh. will I will cut the... Um... If you're asking yourself uh, in the car on the way home, what does this text have to do with me? Basically, I've, I, would, I would state that... Uh, you, we haven't gone, you haven't been taken from exegesis to, to exposition. Exposition of a text always causes you, the, the audience to know what this text means to them personally. And why? Because it's built right into the sermon outline. This particular text is what I call stated in principal language. Each point, well, starting with the, with the propositional statement of what this text means to the audience, all of the uh, sermon points develop that principalized proposition. And so the audience never has to wonder what does this text mean to me? Because every single preaching point is telling him what the text means to him. And we'll talk about that, how we do that. I don't think that in most cases, it's all that helpful to leave application of the text to the end of the sermon. Now, some people are very good at what I'll call um, you know, rather than a, a didactic approach to the text, they're very good at um, showing you, building your anticipation inductively uh, by preaching in, in an inductive method. You have to be a really good preacher uh, to be able to do this. Basically, I think I can think of only one preacher that I'm familiar with who's good at inductive preaching. If you want to go ahead and go that route, uh, give it a try. But uh, basically, I think most preachers are better if they, if they preach deductively. Yes, you've done all the inductive study. Now, when you present it to your audience, you do so in deductively, starting with the conclusion of all your study and showing your listener how each individual portion of the text applies uh, in, that, uh, in that deductive manner. And uh, you're, you're better able to hold your audience's attention, but inductively, if you're good, a very good preacher, you can hold your audience's attention until you get to the end and tell them the application of the message to them, and that's very hard hitting. So if you can do that, more power to you. All right, so this, um, we've got uh, it's nine after, seven after nine, so we're gonna have to take a 10 minute break. See you back in 10 minutes. As Joel, can you, I, I think I've got this back up and running do you see why the application to the end of the sermon? And that's what we've been talking about with deductive versus inductive preaching. Uh, I think unless you're just a very good spellbinding preacher, you're better off doing it deductively. In expository preaching, it's best to enunciate uh, in your preaching proposition right up front 
the main application you're going to make to your audience. And so, for instance, on a message in work, <clears throat> what you're doing is in stating your message's proposition, it's the most general point of application you're going to make to your audience. And uh, just to, just to uh, set you up here uh, overall, Book of Ecclesiastes uh, emphasizes that we must enjoy our labor. If we don't enjoy what we do, that's a problem because God has given us work as a gracious provision for us. And uh, so any message on the book is going to emphasize that we need to enjoy what we do. If we don't enjoy what we are doing, A, maybe we're doing the wrong thing, maybe we should switch and, and do something else, or number two, it could be a heart problem. We just uh, need to inform ourselves what the scripture says about work and, and uh, trust the Lord to give us the right perspective towards it. Okay? All right, now, you're in, in this message, your, your preaching proposition is the key element of your sermon. Okay, so that's the most important thing that I'm looking for in a sermon uh, outline. In deriving your proposition, you must review your exegetical study and make sure that you have all the data in your head at one time. All right, so you're taking all of your contextual analysis, you're, doing, you're taking all of your lexical syntactical analysis, you're, doing, you're taking all of your um, historical, if you've done some, some viewing of, of how this passage relates historically to, to the overall sweep of scripture, you've, uh, you've taken into account your biblical theology study, your systematic study, you understand how the entire process uh, of, exeg of exegesis uh, has informed your thinking about this passage. And then what you're doing is you're stating it uh, here in, in, your in, your, uh, in your propositional statement for your message. It's not up to your own cleverness to determine what the central idea of a passage is. It's the details of the text that dictate to you the content and shape of the passage. So <clears throat> what I'm emphasizing here is that we're not after cleverness. Uh, we're after uh, studying the text objectively uh, interpreting it according to good rules of hermeneutics, and we are out to now state to our audience what the Holy Spirit intended central proposition of the passage is. Ask yourself the question, how can I state the essence of the exegetical details of the text in timeless language that applies directly to my modern audience. Now, it's easy to read that statement and say, okay, I get that. It's much more difficult to actually do it. <laughs> uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is the most difficult thing you do in the preparation of any sermon, it is to ask yourself the question, how can I state the essence of all the, exe all the exegetical details of the text in timeless language that applies directly to my modern audience? That's what the propositional statement does. And 
that's the first thing I look at when I'm grading your sermons. Did you get that right? Or are you just simply stating a content outline? We'll talk about the difference here in just a moment. The proposition should be just broad enough to encompass the range of interpretive elements you have identified, but not too broad. Beware also that you do not make the proposition too narrow either. It's uh, some, something like, um, uh, keep in mind Goldilocks and the three bears. You know, here's Goldilocks and she, she stumbles upon the, the home of the three bears and she, uh, she tries out Papa Bear's bed and it's too, too hard. Mama Bear's, Baby Bear's, this was a, no. Mama Bear's bed's too soft, but Baby Bear's bed is just right. I forget how the, how the little uh, story goes, but um, that, that's what you're gonna wanna do. You're gonna, you're gonna wanna state a proposition that's just broad enough to incorporate all the exegetical detail but not so broad it could refer to any particular passages in the Old Testament. On the other hand, you don't want to make your proposition too narrow so that you exclude uh, some of the key exegetical study that you've done. So it's, it, imagine it's an umbrella. Your umbrella is not too big so that five people could fit under it, but it's not so narrow of an umbrella that you're, it's, you're, it's letting you get wet in the, in the rain, you know, it's like, it's not broad enough to uh, encompass your shoulders. And so your shoulders are getting wet, but some of you staying dry. Your, your umbrella has to be just right. This process is usually the most difficult step in expository preaching. So you may have to state and revise your proposition several times before you feel that it fits the passage just right. And so don't be afraid of revising your proposition. That's certainly uh, within the realm of, of, of what you is, is proper and uh, valid. All right, deriving your main points. Now, the main points for your message must develop the proposition by advancing your audience's understanding of what the passage says as it progresses. Main points do not simply restate portions of your proposition. What that means is, I think you should probably try to shoot for a very succinct proposition. In other words, your, 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 your proposition should should be stated in as few words as possible. And then that makes it easier for you to develop the proposition uh, as you state your main points. Now, by the way, too, some messages don't need anything more than your main points, because it's very difficult for a, an audience to, rem to remember uh, anything beyond your main points. You might have sub points uh, that develop the main points. That's fine, but don't expect your audience to remember it all. That's why I many times recommend that your audience be looking at a PowerPoint or at a printed outline of your message to help them cement in their minds uh, what uh, the structure of your message and keep everything well sorted as you're going through it. So if, if I don't think it's wrong for a preacher to use um, some kind of a visual aid, I don't think it's wrong for your audience to have a printed uh, outline of what you're saying in your message. Matter of fact, I, I recommend that. Keep in mind that not all sermons uh, from the prophets or any other passage for that matter should follow a verse-by-verse -verse format. Now, there are times 
when it's important to follow uh, a verse by verse format. But that would be things like, oh, if, say, if you're preaching from the book of Romans or Ephesians or Colossians or one of the epistles where Paul is developing a tightly uh, structured argument and it's logical, and then you, you can preach chronologically verse after verse from the text. But many times in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon is not developing a tightly woven argument. And so I don't think it's necessarily the case that you have to preach verse by verse. Per, per, if, you're, if your passage <clears throat> is not structured that way, logically, verse upon verse upon verse, then you are free to preach all the uh, verses in a, in a preaching passage that develop a particular topic. And then your next main point may be, once again, uh, verses that develop that topic, but they, they are not necessarily following along chronologically in the passage. This is the, we're, we're used to mostly New Testament preaching where it is important to, to preach one verse after the other. But in the wisdom books, in the prophets, and in the poetic books, this is not so much the case. So open, leave yourself open to the possibility that you don't have to preach verse by verse by verse through a passage. You may choose to do so. It may work in a particular passage you're looking at. But then again, it may not be the best way to do it. Now, that's kind of a different uh, thing for us. Anybody have any questions or comments about that? I, I, I resonate with that very much. Um, both, well, I got this from watching another guy preach through Proverbs. And so he did, did it thematically. And it was fabulous. Um, yeah. And so when I, I was asked to do a couple of conference series going through Ecclesiastes, doing it thematically, the more I did it, I was just sold. Yeah, this is the way to do it. And certainly some of the sections hang together, like I think doing chapter, uh, well, one to two, and then that poem at the beginning of three, and the poem of chapter 12, you know, those sections hang together. But then to do like a a single message that goes through or set of messages that go through the enjoy life motif. It just made sense. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it just depends on what part of the scripture you're in. And I would suggest that when you're preaching in Ecclesiastes, generally speaking, now there are some sections that hang together and you can do the verse by verse thing, but preaching thematically, that's what you want to try to develop. If you start, let's say you're going to preach a, sec, a, a, a series of messages on the book of Ecclesiastes, and you start at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and preach all the way through verse by verse by verse to the last verse of chapter 12, uh, I don't think you're going to have a congregation left. <laughs> hey, now, you could try that. Like I say, you might be able to pull it off if you're a really good preacher. But uh, I think that in the case of the book of Ecclesiastes, expositional preaching should go thematically. Uh, you're doing a lot of analysis for something like this. It's a huge amount of work. And I think that's why we're not seeing more uh, message, message, uh, you know, series that are based on on uh, thematic preaching because they are so much work. Um, I've read books on on how to preach, read a lot of them, and uh, some of these folks are suggesting that you preach six, that you prepare six months ahead of your preaching series. 
Now, why do they say that? Well, they say that because that's basically the only way you can do a thematic sermon series on a biblical book. Actually, Ecclesiastes, with only 12 chapters, is a pretty good, uh, you know, manageable section of material. But try preaching from the book of Isaiah thematically. Now you've got 66 chapters, and you've got many different complex themes. And to preach thematically through a prophet, a major prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, is going to require huge amounts of time ahead of time for you to prepare so that you will, be, you will be able to show your people what the biblical theological structure and content of a, of a major prophet is, or preaching through, uh, Joel mentioned, the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters, uh, and I mean, Solomon develops this book um, uh, by, by hitting a particular theme here and then not talking about it for a few more chapters and he hits it again and maybe he doesn't talk about it for a few more chapters and hits it again. And now as a preacher, you have to put it all together. This is um, a daunting task. And I, I hope that by talking about a smaller biblical book like Ecclesiastes, that I can develop this thinking in you to preach, not chronologically, but thematically. And uh, another, another good book to start off in this regard, pick something like the Book of Ruth, or, <clears throat> uh, you know, some of the shorter biblical books that would lend themselves well to this kind of thematic preaching. But certainly Ecclesiastes uh, definitely lends itself well to this. Now, try to keep your outline fairly simple. It's okay, for instance, to develop a message that has main points only. If you do have subpoints, however, they must logically develop the main points. Okay, so there's, there's a, in a well-structured outline, there's coherence. The message goes somewhere. In other words, you start off your proposition, your main point one develops that by enhancing your, your uh, audience's awareness of what that biblical book says about that particular point. And then point number two, ought to likewise develop the proposition. So all the main points develop the proposition. If you have subpoints, then the subpoints develop the main point. And everything must be logically coherent. Now, do you think it's easy to develop a preaching outline that way? Well, just go ahead and try it. You're going to find as you go through, it's not easy. You're going to have to revise your preaching outline as you go along. That's fine. Uh, revise it. It's not final until you preach it. And uh, sometimes I've, I've been sitting there waiting to preach a particular uh, message, and I thought to myself, great heavenly days, I don't think I structured this outline <laughs> very well in the second point. And so I'll take out my notes while the pastor is giving, um, you know, maybe some general announcements. And I'll make changes to my sermon outline just before I preach it. Uh, it's, it's not final till you preach it. So it's always susceptible to revision. The outline structure results in a logical, co logical coherence of the outline. Subpoints develop the main points and main points develop the proposition. Uh, and if you will structure your outline this way, I think it will be a tremendous blessing 
to the people who sit and listen to you. You know, most congregations are fairly, well, they're, com they're comprised of diverse people. Some of the people in our, that are sitting there listening to us are newly saved. They know virtually nothing about the Bible. And so I would, it would, they will probably find your preaching to be fascinating, no matter how good or bad you are. <laughs> However, there may be people who are in your congregation, and they're like me. They've listened to thousands of preached messages. They have graded thousands of sermon outlines. They are very used to being able to spot good preaching and good and good preparation. And it usually, for instance, I can usually judge whether this sermon's going to go someplace in the first minute the fellow's preaching. Uh, and so what I have to do is I have to be careful because if I if I con conclude in my mind that this this guy doesn't know what he's doing. I still, I still want to get something out of the message. There's, there's no such thing, ultimately, as a bad message preached by a Bible-believing person who has a heart uh, to communicate the Word of God. And so I have to find myself, uh, I, have to, to, I have to remind myself, you know, okay, this may not be the way I would have structured the outline. I don't think the fellow knows what he's doing here, but I'm still going to get a blessing out of this message because this dear brother has put a lot of work into this, and I can still learn what the Holy Spirit has for me today from this passage of Scripture. But we have, you know, we have congregations that some people are just newly saved, others have been saved for decades. I teach a uh, adult Bibles, an adult Sunday school class at the church I go to here in Greenville, South Carolina, and I've got this one dear lady in class who has been saved for over 70 years and who has been reading her Bible consistently for 70 years. Do you think that dear lady knows what the scripture says? Oh, yes, she does. And sometimes when I ask a question in class, this lady has the answer. And one of my seminary students might be in class, and my seminary student is stumped. But this, this dear lady who's never had a Bible class, who has been reading her Bible for 70 years, she's got the answer. And it's a terrific answer. So, uh, You've got a wide, wide variety of people, and you have to keep that in mind, that you want to be able to <clears throat> incorporate, or you want to be able to draw in all the way from new believers to believers who have been in church for their whole adult lives, and many of them since they were children, and they've been reading the Bible, they know the Bible, they know the interpretation of the scripture, even though they've they haven't been formally taught by the, the uh, you know, technical details of preaching. All right, now we get to the point where we're asking the question, if you have a message that has main points and some subpoints, what develops the subpoints? All right, that's a good question. Glad you asked that. And here's what does. I call them paragraphs of Proof. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you is that when you preach a text, you are like a, a uh, prosecuting attorney in a courtroom. You are out to convince the jury of the that, uh, that this particular person who's been charged with the crime is really guilty. Right? So. You say, well, how am I like a prosecuting attorney? You're out to, to prove to the jury, that is, your hearers in your congregation, that this text really teaches what you just said it does. 
right? So you're out to convince your audience that the point you just made is valid. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do it with the details of your preaching text. So paragraphs of proof develop subpoints by proving to your audience with exegetical details from the text the validity of your subpoint. Now, what you say, somebody might say, but wait a minute, you said it was okay if we didn't have subpoints, just main points. Well, then the paragraph of proof goes under the main point and proves the, the, the validity of the main point you just made. But always what proves to your audience validity of what you just said is what the text says, what the text means. Your only, your only means of proof, your only uh, method of persuasion, your only means of persuasion is carefully interpreted uh, textual biblical statements. You don't have any, you know, you, nobody's, nobody ought to believe you just simply because you're standing up there uh, and talking. Or you might say, uh, I'm the pastor of this church. People uh, have to believe what I say because I'm the pastor. Well, I'm glad you're the pastor, but just because you have a, a particular biblical office of overseer, pastor, uh, does not necessarily mean that you're right in everything you say. I mean, once again, your only uh, method of persuasion, your only means of persuasion is the scriptures. And so the paragraph of proof is another thing that I'm looking for in your sermon outline. And uh, it can contain certain things that, um, you wouldn't necessarily say if you were preaching a message. In other words, I want to see exegetical details that you have um, learned from your own exegesis of the passage or from commentary literature that you've studied carefully. And the commentator is supplying you with your exegetical detail that is above your expertise level as to what you could have understood on your own, okay? So the paragraph of proof is the time to give me all the exegetical information you know. Uh, and even though you wouldn't say to your audience every single thing that's in there, because your audience might not know what, uh, for instance, the significance of a, a verb is in the hefeel form. Uh, it, but you've, you've gotten that from a commentary, and you, know, you now know some of the, the usages of the hefeel theme in the uh, in Hebrew verb structure. Um, all right, so the paragraphs of proof need to be very well developed. They need to be packed with exegetical detail. And so I look at these, I scrutinize your paragraphs of proof. Are you doing a good job uh, proving to your audience, which in the case of the sermon outline is me, uh, are you doing a good job proving the validity of what you just said? Now, this is extremely important. So are there any questions about this, these paragraphs of proof? All right. Well, if you think of any later, let me know. And I, so I say, the only authority you rightly possess as a preacher stems from correctly interpreted exegetical details found in God's Word. God blesses His Word, not your imagination or your clever illustration. Now, here is a very important point I want to make. 
The purpose of illustrations is not to prove anything. Correctly interpreted exegetical details from the text prove truth. Illustrations illustrate the truth. They make it, they tie it to something in everyday life or some story that you read about that shows that particular concept in operation or some, some story you've even made up, as long as you tell your audience you've made it up, uh, could illustrate the truth. I've got some things in, in, my, in my book, illustrations from some of my, some of my uh, interaction with students over my career, or maybe some things that I went through. And I'll, I'll tell my people who are, I'll tell the reader that I changed the names, you know, so that I don't embarrass or, or you know, cause any, any kind of problems for the person that I'm talking about. Uh, some, it, it never ceases to amaze me when I talk about real life illustrations in class, somebody will know the person I'm talking about, even though I've changed the person's name. And uh, it's, it's really, it's really remarkable how people figure this out. So we have to be very careful. And whatever you do, don't use illustrations about people in your congregation, okay? Unless they're illustrations that are very positive. Don't you dare use somebody in your congregation as a negative example of something, because people will figure this out lightning fast. And uh, the person may be sitting there in the congregation and you're using them as a, as a negative illustration they're likely not to be back again the next the next Sunday. Uh, you, you, can, you can scandalize people to the point where they don't even care to sit, sit there and listen to you. So be very careful about illustrations. But always remember, illustrations do not establish truth. They just simply illustrate the truth. And, you know, I don't know how many messages I've heard where the, a person, the preacher who's preaching, will be cruising along and they're using an illustration and they haven't proved to me from the text the validity of that, of that uh, truth they're illustrating. They're intending the illustration to prove the point. And that's illegitimate. Now, any questions on that? All right. Illustrations, as I say, do not create truth. They illustrate the truth that exegesis identifies. So, develop the paragraphs of proof as extensively as you can. Quick question. Sometimes these, yeah, question. I'm concerned uh, here. Um, someone was asking, so the paragraphs, for the purpose of this project, um, the paragraphs of proof, do you want those to be developed with a layman in mind, or do you want them to be developed on a seminary teacher level? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying develop them with as many um, exegetical details as you can, even though when you are actually preaching the message, you wouldn't be technical, as technical as what you're talking, as what you have just said in your paragraph. But the reason why I like to do it this way is so that in future times, I'm assuming you keep all of your old messages uh, in, on file, uh, or you, you, you have a filing system that you keep them on your computer under, or whatever, you can go back and review. You're, you're gonna forget the exegetical details of your study after six months, after five years, you're not gonna remember anything, you, you studied about that passage, and yet you're going to want to preach that again, maybe in five years, if you, if you record all of your exegetical study, 
then you can bring yourself back up to speed on the passage. And then when you're preaching it, you can explain to your audience uh, the, 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 the theological and exegetical truths in simpler fashion that anybody, any lay person can understand. Uh, so I, I, I want them, I want the paragraphs of proof to be very developed, very detailed, and at however high a level of exegetical analysis you're capable of. Okay, good. You might want to structure an illustration. Illustrations shine the light of understanding on a scriptural truth. The best illustrations are analogies, basically analogy, maybe in story form. You could pick a historical event uh, or a person that shows the truth that you're preaching about in action. If you make up a fictional story, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, as long as you tell your audience about its fictional status. Be very careful, especially, of illustrations you get from the internet. Sometimes the internet, <laughs> excuse me, uh, basically does not represent uh, a, a, an illustration as it actually historically happened. Uh, for instance, I was listening to a message one time, and it was a story of an aviator named Butch O'Hare. And uh, Butch O'Hare is actually the person who, for whom O'Hare uh, International Airport is named for in Chicago. O'Hare Airport is named after this fellow, and he was a Navy uh, aviator. He was very, he was a very accomplished flyer. He uh, was commendably brave when it came to engaging enemy forces. But the person who was preaching this got off the internet an absolutely absurd uh, account of something that supposedly Butch O'Hare went through. And anybody who would have been sitting in the audience who is a pilot, as I am, uh, would have instantly realized the person was, was just spewing nonsense. At one point, let me just give you an example of this. At one point, he claimed that Butch O'Hare, when his, uh, his plane's guns had jammed, uh, took out a Japanese Zero by clipping the, hit the tail of the, of the uh, enemy aircraft with his propeller, which is just the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. So I sat there listening to this absurd illustration, went back to my office, and uh, went on a website that analyzes incorrect um, internet stories. And sure enough, this came from an internet story where it was embellished with ludicrous things. And the particular person, I, I talked with the person after he preached this message, and, and I said, did, did you get your sermon illustration off at such and such a website? He said, yeah, wasn't it a good one? <laughs> and I had to look at him and say, I'm sorry, brother, but that, that was a website that was all full of mistakes and, and inaccuracies and embellishments, and it, was, it wasn't true. You need to do a better job of checking something you get off the interstate to make sure it's actually true. And uh, I don't know if the person's forgiven me in his heart's since then, but I was, I, I was a little bit indignant, frankly, about how he had done it. All right, now, paragraphs of explanation, of application. These are very important. Each passage of scripture has one meaning, but many possible applications. A 
of the truth. It's appropriate from time to time during your message to suggest at least one way a particular truth might apply to a person today. We live in a vastly different historical and cultural setting from the original uh, setting of the scripture. So most hearers could greatly benefit from hearing how a biblical truth applies in a strictly parallel situation in our culture or whatever culture you're in. Uh, many of you live in a, in a remarkably different culture than I do here in America. And so the way you apply this is going to be different from the way I might apply it. Uh, but, but what we do is we help our listeners understand how biblical truth uh, applies legitimately to them in whatever cultural situation you're in. And you're going to write this paragraph out exactly as you would say it in your message. All right, so clearly identify when you're talking about a paragraph of proof, identify it as paragraph of proof. When you're giving an illustration, illustrate it or identify it as a paragraph of illustration. Identify your paragraphs of application. So there's absolutely no doubt in my mind what you're doing. All right, and when you come to the conclusion of your message, uh, the purpose of your conclusion is to suggest how your hearers might apply the most important truth you presented in your sermon. So you're taking the most general application from your message, and you want your listeners to take that away with them from your message. Remember that there are likely as many ways to apply this truth as there are people in the congregation. Uh, as you present one or two possible applications, you're trusting that the Holy Spirit will be working in hearts to, the po to point out how each person should put the truth that you preached about into practice. All right, so um, as I say, Write this conclusion out, if you would, please, exactly as you would say it. Well, we're a couple minutes over our allotted time, so this is a good place to, to uh, stop. Now, next time, what I'll do is I'll actually go through a particular text and show you how I would structure a, uh, an expositional outline. It will not be Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 20. Uh, that's up to you to do. But I think I'll probably pick out a, a passage. As I recall, I've, I've done a passage from the book of Isaiah here. And uh, I'll just illustrate it from a, a prophetic book. All right. Well, uh, be looking forward to seeing you on Thursday. And we'll, we'll talk more about the message and then we'll get back to the theology of Ecclesiastes. Okay, Joel, do you have any particular announcements you want to make? No, sir, none. Um, if, well, I can say this, if anyone had any trouble before with filling out the reading checks on the Moodle page, uh, it should be okay now. I think I've got it fixed. If not, let me know, and I'm happy to work with you to make sure that that's working okay, but it should be okay. And that's it. So thanks. We will see everyone again on Thursday. Thank you, Dr. Yeagley. Okay. See you Thursday.